Hello, I'm Natasha from Natasha Smart Textiles. I'm a wet felter and I run wet felting workshops and share tutorials like this one. In this wet felting tutorial, I'm going to show you how to make an embellished clutch purse with back fibre and curly locks. Um, it's the curly locks along with some yarns which, uh, which make the, the fringed part uh, for the purse. Now, if you've seen any of my previous tutorials, you'll know that so far we've only been working with merino wool fibre. Um, and merino is a very fine fibre which comes uh, predominantly in these uh, long lengths called tops or roving. And the fibre's all been carded and combed all neatly so that they're all, all the fibres are, are running in the same direction. Uh, so very commonly used, very easy to work with. Um, but there is a, a whole woolly world out there of a different fibre which or, or different sheep fibres which come in bat form. Um, now bat as you can see is quite different to the combed length of merino. This is sort of a, a thick sheet of, of fibres uh, and all of the individual fibres are all going in different directions. So very different material to work with. So if you've ever wondered um, you know how to work with bat fibre um, and fancied giving it a go, then hopefully this tutorial will be for you. Um, now another uh, wool product um, that you also might have seen but not worked with is long curly locks fibres. These ones are particularly long that I'm, I'm using here. Um, and these are almost a, a stage back again in the, in the processing of wool. Um, these are almost, apart from the colour, because they've been dyed, uh, as if they've come straight off the sheep. Um, and these are beautiful things for getting extra texture, um, particularly, uh, and pattern within your felting. So lovely things to use. So again, if you've ever saw these and wondered how on earth do I work with these, what do I do with them, uh, then again, uh, hopefully this tutorial will be, be for you. Um, we're also going to use a flat resist again. Um, if you saw my mobile phone case tutorial, we used a small resist to make a, a pocket hollow form uh, to put a mobile phone in as a, as a case. So this is a, a bigger version with a bigger template um, and we're going to be uh, wrapping our fibre around the template um, to create the hollow form for our purse. So if you imagine that's inside there. Um, and again, the beauty of working with um, a, a template as a resist uh, is that we can make these sorts of forms um, with uh, self-seeming sides. Um, so by wrapping the fibre around the edges of the template, a, a side edge will be created, it will self-seam. So we can create forms like this, pockety type things, uh, without any sewing, which is, is brilliant and all down to the magic of the wool fibres as always. Um, now I think this project will probably take three or four hours once you've assembled all of your um, materials and equipment. I'll put all the measurements, the materials list uh, and everything that you need to know down in the description below, so have a look at that. Um, and any questions please get in touch via comments below. Uh, please do also like this tutorial if you enjoy it and uh, do subscribe to my channel. Um, so thank you for watching again uh, and happy felting. Hope you enjoy this one. So let's start off by looking at the tools and equipment that we need. First of all, you want to be working on some kind of hard work surface underneath, preferably waterproof. Um, so perhaps a kitchen worktop. I'm working on a um, oil skin tablecloth. Uh, or you could have some kind of plastic mat underneath. So that just protects your surface. Then we want to be working inside bubble wrap. Uh, so I've got a piece of bubble wrap here, which is small bubbles, uh, smooth side up, uh, and that's 75 by 50 centimetres. Uh, then we need, obviously, water, um, soapy water. So I've got a spray bottle here, um, which has got a big dollop of washing up liquid in it and warm water. Uh, it's always useful to have a bit of extra soap as well for where we need it. So I've got a big block of this olive oil soap here. Um, any kind of soap will do really, um, but olive soap is commonly used in felting. Then we need some kind of rubbing tool. I've got one of these lovely wooden rubbing tools uh, to use. A rolling tool, so some kind of uh, foam roller is ideal or um, perhaps a rolling pin. 
Um, we're going to need tea towels because things are going to get wet. Probably a big towel as well for, for drying off our purse later. Um, and then some other equipment like ruler, large scissors, a tape measure is always useful um, and also definitely some scales. So they'll be coming to play in a, in a moment. Um, also a piece of plastic or spare bit of bubble wrap, just a small bit, uh, which will also be coming into play a bit later on. The other key bit of kit that we're going to need is a template to make our purse form around. Uh, this one's made out of thin packaging foam, uh, which is ideal. It's um, waterproof, um, fairly substantial and hardy. Um, the fibres can't migrate through it. Uh, and very importantly, it's quite flexible. We're going to be rolling the felt inside the template later on in the process. So we need to be able to roll up the template as well. So that flexibility is quite important. Uh, now this one measures 30 centimetres uh, in the length and 23 centimetres uh, in the width. And of course the other key ingredient is our materials. So um, I've got 50 grams of thin wool bat fibre. Um, now you could use any type of bat fibre. I'm using thin wool because it's what I commonly use so I've got a lot of it. Uh, but any bat fibre will, will do. Um, I've got that 50 grams divided into three different colours because I'm aiming for a sort of graduated ombre effect uh, on the felt. So I've got 20 grams of this lighter turquoise and 15 grams each of the mid and dark blue. So that's our wool fibre. Then as decoration on top, I've got three different sorts of um, kind of slubby art yarns. Um, you could use as many as you like. Um, I've just raided my stash for colours that I thought went nicely together. So I've got two yarns that are this sort of thick and thin wool yarn. Um, I think the important thing here, uh, again, is that they are high wool content yarns because then I know that they will felt in well uh, into the fibre. Um, this one actually, also a thick and thin yarn, but it's been made partly with bamboo. Um, and which that gives it rather a nice sheen, uh, which I think is really lovely against the, the matteness of the, of the wool felt. So those are my two thick and thin yarns. And then I've also got a wool and silk mix yarn, uh, which again gives a really nice sort of sheen against the felt uh, in the end. Uh, so those are my three yarns that I've picked. Um, and probably you'll need uh, about 15 metres in total of yarns. Uh, and then the final thing is uh, curly locks. Um, now these are hand dyed uh, masham sheep locks, um, which, are, which are rather lovely. Um, these are very long locks and I think particularly for this project it's quite useful to have a long lock uh, rather than lots of short ones. I think it ends up looking more impressive in, because you've got the fringe. Um, so uh, these are particularly long, long ones, which are rather lovely. Um, and you'll probably need about 15 grams uh, or so of uh, curly locks to use. So before we start, let's just talk briefly about working with bat fibre, which is obviously quite different to working with, uh, say, merino tops or roving, which comes in big carded lengths. Um, bat fibre comes in sheets and to work with it you can just peel it apart or tear it and then lay it down on your surface to start building up whatever it is that you want. Um, now you can imagine it's slightly harder um, because this is a bit of a vaguer way of doing it um, than with sort of the, the very um, exact overlapping tiles method that you generally use with merino when you lay it out. So um, it, it is harder to be sort of precise and know that you've got even layers with bat fibre. 
Um, so that's why I find that weighing the fibre is really essential so that you know, um, you know exactly what you're using. It doesn't matter so much if you're just making a flat piece because you can just lay it, lay it out and, and feel it um, and pat it to sort of check where you've got thick and thin bits. But for something like working on a template uh, where you're trying to get very even amounts on each side, it's better to weigh it. So what we're going to do here is um, divide all of our 50 grams up into quarters um, because what we're going to do on the template um, we're actually going to do two complete layers on both sides of the template. Um, now we're doing two layers rather than one because that also helps us get a bit more control over how much we're putting on, whether things are even, we can make adjustments. So rather than doing um, putting half of our fibre on one side um, and half on the other straight away. We're going to do them as um, uh, sort of half the allocation each side first uh, and that just will help us to uh, keep things a bit neater and make adjustments as we go along. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so I'm going to now divide all this up into four. Now I've got three different colours here so it's not completely straightforward but I'm basically just going to weigh everything. So I had 20 grams of the turquoise for instance so that works out at five grams per layer. So I'm going to weigh it all as evenly as I can. Um, now don't worry if you end up with all sorts of different sized pieces uh, at the end. You're thinking oh how on earth am I gonna gonna kind of make that neat on top of the template. Um, Part of the sort of ease of working with bat fibre, I find actually, is that you can create a sort of patchwork effect. So, um, you know, you tear a piece, uh, however you want it, you know, and you kind of infill um, and lay other pieces down, down next to it, just overlapping slightly, making sure you've got wispy edges, just as you would with merino. Um, and you sort of build up your layers that way and, you know, keep patting it, keep checking for thin bits. Oh, there's a thin bit there. I'll just pull off a slight amount and uh, and add that to it. And although it looks very bumpy and uneven, it's actually the feel of it that's probably more important. Um, and once we've wetted everything down, it makes it much easier to see as well where, where you've got thin and thick uh, spots that we need to, to adjust. So don't worry about even, uneven sized pieces. Um, uh, that will all kind of uh, come out in uh, in the wash later um, because we can work in this kind of patchwork effect of um, bat fibres. Um, so to start with, just divide everything up uh, into uh, quarters uh, and then we'll start off working with our first quarter allocation. So the first thing we're going to do is lay out our fibre. Now I'm working on my bubble wrap. I've opened out the whole piece. I'm just going to work on half of it um, and the other half will be free to uh, sandwich over the template and the fibre a bit later on. The template is oriented portrait style. Uh, and here's my first allocation of uh, the bat fibre. So this is 12 or 13 grams of fibre in three colours. Um, and that's for our first side of this first layer. So um, I've peeled some of it apart. Uh, and I'll just continue to do that uh, and place it on the template. Um, and as with all fibre, it's better to have more thinner layers than fewer thick layers. Um, that all helps with controlling the evenness of, of what we're laying out. So um, I've already kind of tugged this slightly into a perfect shape. I'm kind of going for bands going across. So this is my first one. Now we because we want to cover what will actually be the sort of very side edges um, of our template and our eventual purse, uh, we want to overlap the template by probably two or three centimetres uh, on all the edges, apart from the top edge. Um, in actual fact, we're just going to stop short of the top edge. But everywhere else, we want to go over um, by two or three centimetres so that we get a good uh, overlap onto the other side. So I've put one bit of the blue down. Just going to stretch that one out a little bit more. And we always still want to have nice wispy edges where fibre joins fibre. 
um, because again that all helps with the bonding. Now you can see here I've got a sort of odd thicker bit so I'm just going to look and see where it looks a bit thinner. Well actually if I shift that over a bit I could perhaps just stretch that out and put that there and fluff it out. So I hope you understand what I mean about this uh, idea of laying out all the fibre as a kind of patchwork. Um, bat fibre is, is very different to work with, um, but it's slightly more uh, relaxed, I suppose, than with merino, where generally you're being very, very precise with your fibres. This is actually a bit more freeform, uh, which actually is quite, quite nice. Um, I've probably gone over a bit there, so let me pull that bit off and put that there. So I'm just sort of piecing, piecing the bits together. And also, because I've got a bit more of that blue one, I want a bit more space up here, so I'm just going to kind of scrunch that up a little bit. So in a way, the back fibre is, is quite forgiving in terms of layout, and it's much, much quicker to do layouts, I find, than uh, working with Merino. So all fibres have their different challenges, I think. Um, okay. And it's rather nice, you can just tear it into the shapes that you want and stretch it. And as I said, I'm making sure that I leave a bit of a gap there at the top edge. And the idea is you can keep patting it, keep feeling for where there are uh, thicker or thinner bits that need, uh, need a bit of adjusting. I can feel that where I've got my overlaps, that feels quite thick and then it goes a bit thin. So obviously I need to fill that in a little bit. Okay. That feels pretty even to start with. So um, the next thing to do then is to wet the fibre. So with my trusty spray bottle, I'm going to give everything a bit of a soak. Now we're not actually going to be doing any felting, rubbing um, just yet. The purpose of this bit of wetting down now uh, is actually just to try and secure the fibres in place initially until we've got all of our layers on. So it doesn't have to be completely soaked um, and ready for, for sort of rubbing. Uh, we're really just trying to secure everything. And as you can see, when you spread uh, or when you um, put water onto the fibres, they do kind of spread out a bit. So we're going to have plenty of overlap onto the other side, uh, which is just what you want. Okay, um, now to try and flatten uh, the fibres, because it all looks pretty bumpy and uneven at the moment, I'm actually going to fold over my other half of the bubble wrap. I'm using my rubbing tool, which actually I'll give a spray to first because that always makes it um, uh, run a bit more smoothly. I'm just rubbing it across, and the purpose of this is just to flatten those fibres down and to get the water to distribute um, through them. So we're not rubbing to felt at this stage, just to soak the water through. And once everything looks flat, um, then I'm going to peel back the bubble wrap so we can turn the whole thing over. Now if at this stage it doesn't look flat and still looks very dry and bumpy, then 
just spray a bit more water on because that's what you'll need. Okay, so that's the first uh, side in this first layer done. And I'm just making sure up here that we stay off that top edge. Okay, so we're gonna pick it up and turn it over. And you'll see already just by putting that bit of soapy water on, that's done enough to keep things uh, together. Okay, so then we're going to fold over these fluffy side edges. I might give them a little bit of a spray first, because that will help. I'm going to do the side edges first and just fold them over, keeping the, the wispiness. We don't want lumpy parts here because um, obviously uh, that will end up with um, big lumps in the end. Um, and also it's harder for, for big lumps of fibre to felt together. By keeping things nice and smooth and wispy, um, the fibres have an easier time of bonding together. Got a slightly lumpy bit there. Let me see if I can smooth that out. Okay, now that's the side edges done. Um, when it comes to the bottom, obviously you've got a bit of a fold overlap here. Um, so you could end up with quite thick amounts of fibre on the edges. So to sort of counter that, I'm going to fold that over. Still seems a bit wet, so I'll get that dry, so I'll give that a spray. And you can see where we've got this sort of fold here. In actual fact, if you fluff that out, we can thin it a bit, make it a bit more wispy. Fold it around and that gives a nice tight corner without a visible fold, which obviously is what we what we are aiming for. We don't want to have a big, big lumpy fold there. So the fibres just with a bit of a spray of soapy water um, will hold together enough for you to, to do things like this to make quite a nice neat edge. I seem to have a bit of a lump there. Let me try and get rid of that. Okay. So that's our first side complete. So now we'll put the side two layer one allocation of fiber on. First thing I'm going to do though is dry my hands and also just dry this area where I'm going to put the fibre uh, because um, obviously working with uh, wet fibre becomes very difficult. So here's my next allocation. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing here. Laying out my dark blue first. I'm going to tear that up a bit. Um, now we had quite a big overlap in the end down this bottom part so um, although we still want to overlap the edges each time um, I can actually afford to have a bit less uh, on this overlap I think. And again just sort of piecing together the, pe the different pieces of the bat fibre. Okay, so I'm going to carry on with this um, to finish this second layer and then I'm going to repeat the whole thing again uh, with my other two allocations of fibre. Um, so I'll speed that up now and then show you what it looks like when it's finished. So that's our bat fibre layouts complete. So we've got two complete layers of the fibre. Um, now you might wonder, could we have just done uh, each side and done, done a thick layer rather than two thin layers on each side? Um, you could do, 
but I think the advantage of doing them as separate, two separate thinner layers is with things like the overlap where you're able to sort of wisp it out more because there's less fibre there to deal with. Um, I think the danger if you'd done everything in um, just one go, uh, so one big layer rather than two, um, that um, things would uh, just end up being a bit thick um, and a bit lumpy. Whereas this actually, uh, doing the separate layers as we've done, just enables you to get a nice, um, pretty tight uh, sort of wrap around the template, um, even out any thick bits um, and get quite a good even, even layout. So um, now, now would be the time if you wanted to add any more, for instance, if we were give it a good good pat, and if we notice some significant thin bits, we could add a little bit more fibre, some wisps wherever we wanted it. Um, if the colours of the fibre were really important, that they were precise, you can see here that um, you know I haven't got a clean line really going from the turquoise into the mid blue, but in actual fact, for this project, because we're going to cover the fibre with so many different um, yarns and the curly locks. That actually doesn't matter, so I'm not going to worry about it. But if it did matter, we could add some wisps to the design now um, just to, to even everything up. But from the point of view of getting our base structure right, which is what we're doing here, um, I'm quite happy with that. And it all seems nice and even and we've got a good thickness on. Um, the 50 grams that we're using is, I would say, the sort of ideal amount, but aim for it as a, as a minimum, really. Um, to ensure that we've got enough fibre on here to make a, a substantial um, end purse that's going to be thick enough to uh, withstand, um, you know, opening and closing and holding things in it. Okay, so our layout of the fibre is done. The other thing that we're going to do before we add our decoration is to turn back the top edge. Um, now, the idea with that is, at the moment, we've got quite a wispy thin edge, um, but if we turn it back, by sort of a couple of centimetres, something like that. Then we'll end up with a much firmer, cleaner edge than this very wispy one. So I'm just fluffing out the edges because again, if we're folding it back, we want to be able to smooth it sort of invisibly on the rest of the fibre. Um, don't forget these side bits as well. So, that's sort of a centimetre or two minimum in some places, um, you know, three or four centimetres in others, kind of depends how it's all spread out. But what we want is an even uh, amount or line kind of against the template. And we can just smooth that down. And obviously if things are feeling dry and not smoothing down, then give them a squirt. Um, the, Soapy water, I find, always acts as a bit of a temporary glue, which is quite helpful. Okay, so I'm quite ha happy with with that. We're sort of a centimetre or so off the top of the template. So let's do that on the other side also. Again, make sure things are wet and soapy. Spread out the fibre uh, to make it wispy at the top and then fold it back. And I prefer um, creating forms like this with a, an edge I've created myself rather than the other option would be covering the complete template with fiber and then at a later stage cutting the sort of fibre parcel open, it'd be the equivalent of cutting along this edge um, and then opening uh, and uh, creating uh, the opening that way. But I find uh, I get a neater, firmer edge by doing it this way rather than uh, opening things out later. Okay, so that looks pretty good. I know it looks kind of slightly uneven, but that really doesn't matter at this stage. Um, it will all sort itself out later. Okay, so we can move on to adding our embellishments. 
So with our fibre layout complete, the next thing we're going to do is add our yarns, which is our first stage of decoration. So I've got my three yarns here. You can either um, start laying out your yarns on the ball and then cut it, or cut them into individual lengths to start with. So um, I've got some pieces here that are about 75 centimetres, 80 centimetres long, uh, and some that are I'll just cut off the ball. So um, just to show you the different ways of doing it, it depends how much you want to, to prepare. Um, so I'm gonna start with one of these first, which is, this is this thick and thin wool yarn, which um, is 100% wool, so I know it's gonna felt in. So what we're gonna do is lay it on the template with at least seven centimeters, a couple of inches, um, off the end which is our fringe part so just lay it on I'm going to give it a little spray and press down which will hopefully help it just temporarily stay in place because the slightly tricky bit about this project is you've got to keep turning over the template to add yarns um, so we do want things to just be sort of pressed down enough that they will stay in place. So all I've done is laid it back up the other side of the template uh, and then got enough off the end. So obviously that's going to um, become our fringe. So what I'm going to aim for is a bit of a variety of different um, yarns coming off the edge there um, to give the fringe uh, a bit of interest. So I've pushed that down into the wet fibre, so that's pretty much staying there. Um, let's repeat with another one. Uh, and I'm going to go try and go in different directions, uh, alternate things a bit, just again to add interest and to avoid having everything in exactly the same place and uh, big lumps of yarns. So I'm going to try and avoid having too many crossovers as well, um, because that just uh, makes things slightly harder to, to felt in where you're crossing over yarns. Okay, things are holding so far. And again, back up the other side, give it a spray. Now that one is a bit too long on that piece, so I'm just gonna chop that off. And we can also add in separate bits like this um, as well. So nothing is wasted. So I'm gonna give a third go with this one. Put that in the middle. Now interestingly, I've ended up, I guess because of the dye of the, the yarn, you can see um, it's the same colours on this side and the same colours on this side, this dark green. So I'm actually going to take that one off and swap it round so that we get different colours. So now we've got the lighter turquoise on this side. So everything is adjustable still at this stage. Just press that in. And it will become easier once we've um, built these layers up and got our locks on as well, then we won't need to worry quite so much about keeping the yarns in place. Okay, that's better because I've now got a um, more of a variation of the colours of that yarn. So I'm just going to use three 
wraps of this one. Um, so let's have a go with this silk and wool mix. And say, work out what's easiest for you, whether having them already cut up into lengths is easier or you prefer just keeping it on the ball. Now, the other thing that to remember um, is ideally not to go too close to these side edges um, with our yarn wrapping because we're sort of interfering with what goes on with edges. Um, so it sort of is a bit easier really if we just stay off those by a couple of centimetres or an inch. So I'm staying in this more central part. Okay, what have I done? I've done three of that one so far. Um, and let's do work on this one. Now this one I haven't cut up, so we're keeping this on the, the ball of yarn. Um, now this is a thick and thin fibre, but has lots of long thin bits. So um, I might sort of choose which bits we end up using uh, to try and either get the thicker bits or the thin thinner bits as we want them. So you can see how we can build up the design with the yarns as much as or as little as you want really. And plus we're also building up the fringe um, with a good bit of variety going on there. And we will add more on top once we've done the locks as well. So let's move on to adding the curly locks. So these are really soft and lovely locks which have got quite a sheen to them um, really nice and I've got sort of three different colors going on in there so it would be quite nice to get a bit of everything all over um, and a bit of each color within the fringe so I'm going to try and lay these in different directions um, and see what that looks like uh, now with these locks they will felt felt in nicely obviously they're wool fiber as well so um, they uh, I've got the same properties as the fibre has to be able to uh, to felt together. Um, you can leave them in their sort of thick, um, kind of natural tight state. I quite like to pull them apart, tease them apart a little bit. Um, you get a bit more coverage that way uh, and I think it just adds a sort of um, extra attractive layer. Um, now as I say, I'm just going to lay these all over the um, template. Uh, we'll work completely on one side and then wet, the, far, wet the, uh, the curly locks down and then work on the other side. And we also need to remember, obviously, to, to leave some parts for the fringe. So I'm going to fluff that out a bit more. You can also pull them apart to make them a bit smaller. And then they go very sort of wispy and fluffy. So have a play about with these um, locks. They're really, really nice things. And they give a nice sort of organic um, end result to whatever it is you're working on. So I'm gonna lay these all over. Because I've really wisped up that end, I'm not gonna put it on the end as a fringe. I'm just gonna lay that one on as a bit of decoration and the same with this one perhaps actually I'll vary the direction of that one so I'll have the pink up that end okay and then let's take some locks and this time I'm not going to tease out that end because I'll use it for the fringe but I'll tease out the rest a little bit more um, and obviously it being kind of wispy uh, makes it a bit easier to felt in so that part is our fringe bit and then I've opened out the rest a little bit more 
And again, you can use as much or as little of the locks as you want to, just building up the design. I quite like just designing as I go along. I have an idea of what I'm aiming for with the different materials, but I sort of just create and add to the design as I, as I go along and sort of responding to uh, what I think needs to go on next. Okay. Now, as well as having some of the curly locks going over the edge to act as the future fringe, we also want some curly locks to go over this edge because we then will have a continuous sort of run of the locks uh, going on to the other side. So we want a bit of overlap at the bottom edge too so that we can do that. So I'm going to make sure some go over there. So to make it look more continuous and not as if you know, we've just stopped and done one side. Okay, so I've got some pink locks there, so I'm actually going to use that end for some fringe. Tease this bit out. There's a bit of sheep matter. Um, you'll find, in especially in these sort of hand-dyed items and in fact in the in the thin wool fibre as well there's uh, often bits of straw and all sorts in there um, but I try not to worry too much about it generally once you've gone through the whole process uh, these things have largely disappeared. Okay so I'm going to carry on with this um, I'm going to wet it down when I'm happy with it and then turn over to the other side and fold over these um, overlapping parts. So I'll uh, come back and show you what that looks like uh, when it's done. So that's both sides done with locks added um, and I've wet each side and just flattened them down each time just to try and secure them a bit. And I also had a little bit of overlap of the locks from the second side, which I'm just putting back round to the first side now. So the final stage is just to add as many more yarns as we fancy on top of our locks, just as that kind of final embellishment. Um, and obviously to add a bit more into the, to the fringe to ensure we're happy. So I'm gonna do that now and then I'll come back once that's uh, ready to move to the next stage. Okay, that's the final yarn layout finished. So I've ended up with at least another 12 or so yarns on the top and I've tried to vary um, the placement and the, the different colors of those variegated yarns. Um, so that's our layout finished. So now we're going to move on to um, rubbing the fibers to try and get things to start to felt together. So, um, first of all though, that piece of folded up plastic or um, piece of bubble wrap that I mentioned right at the beginning, we're just going to insert this now in between the fringes just to stop them um, felting together or getting tangled up. Okay, so I'm going to give it another spray just to make sure we've got plenty of wetness and soapiness in here because that will help uh, with doing our rubbing. And then fold the template over so we're protecting everything. Uh, and then spray the rubbing tool and then do much more rubbing than obviously we did previously when we were just trying to 
get the fibres to flatten and to soak the water through. Um, this is rubbing to really get all those barbs on the fibres to open up and start grabbing each other and bonding together. So we're probably going to need 15 or 20 minutes, I would say, of rubbing this um, until things are starting to, to lock together. Now you'll notice that I'm just going in one direction with this. Now that's because all of the yarns and locks are going in this direction so it makes sense to keep the rubbing in this direction to avoid disrupting the fibres. If we were going that way you can see how we might end up moving, shifting the fibres left to right, which actually we don't want. We want to keep them in these um, sort of long, straight vertical lines going this way along the template. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, and obviously you don't need to rub the fringe at the end. We're really just focusing on the yarns. Now that's only had a you know a minute or two. Let's just see how things are getting on under there. So if you run your finger across the fibres you'll be able to spot and detect movement. Now you can see the yarns are still moving very much. Um, but I can already see that those curly locks are already starting to, um, to felt in. So that's great. So they're felting to, the, um, to our back fibre. But we also need to get these yarns felting in. And they will be trickier than, than the, the locks and fibres will. So we've just got to keep going and make sure that we've got plenty of soapy water in here to do it. So I've only been rubbing probably so far for, for five minutes. Um, I uh, noticed things aren't getting very soapy and I think it would benefit from a bit more soap because that always helps the process, helps the fibres um, start doing what they do. So um, I've replenished my, wa my soapy water, but I'm also actually gonna deploy a bit of the uh, olive soap, which obviously I talked about at the beginning, just to give an extra sort of hit of, of soap because um, again I've talked before about the soap acting a bit like a temporary glue and um, what it um, can do actually which is quite helpful is almost stick things like the yarns in place just sort of temporarily which seems to help um, to then encourage them to stay in place. Um, it's almost acting a bit like uh, as I say temporary glue so because these yarns are still mostly still moving about so they need a little bit of extra help so i'm gonna add extra soap to this just with my hands um if you like uh grating grating up soap some people do you know you could just sprinkle on some soap so i'm adding quite a bit more uh, soap you can see that's much more lathery now uh, so whenever things are not seeming very soapy or seeming a bit dry um, it will always aid the process and make it more successful having a bit more water and more soap. So there are always things you can do in your felting if things don't seem to be quite working as you'd want them to. So that is almost helping to stick those loose yarns down a little bit. As well as obviously some fresh uh, liquid soapy water. Okay. But some things are already working. I can see that uh, in some places the yarns are quite, uh, quite well stuck in place. So it just needs more work. So that's a bit of extra soaping up just to help things along. 
I'm going to rub a bit more on this side and then I'll um, add soap to the other side as well. You also might be wondering why I haven't used net to work through for rubbing. Um, I know on previous tutorials using merino fibre I have um, used net. Um, now I find with net that especially when you've got a lot of embellishment um, you have to be really careful about the embellishments felting to the net when you start rubbing it. So sometimes and I think I'm coming to the conclusion actually the more of the time um, it's better to just use a piece of bubble wrap um, or a piece of thin plastic on top because then you don't get that issue of your yarns and fibres and everything felting to the net. So that's why I'm not using it today. And of course you don't need to use um, you know, a specific rubbing tool like this either. You could just use some kind of kitchen cloth, um, soapy and soaked and rub that across either. Um, but in order to sort of maximise effort, um, over the last few years I've, I've realised that these tools actually are a, are a godsend really to help um, increase your hand surface area, um, to increase agitation because it's a ridged surface um, and it just makes the process quicker and more effective. So as a bit of a time saver, uh, I always use these rubbing tools now. Okay, so yeah, we're definitely getting there. Uh, and the other thing that we can do if things are really still moving around and you can see probably on each end where I'm not doing quite as much rubbing because it's really with rubbing, you know, the centre area is getting all the, um, all the effort really. Uh, but on the edges, there's still a bit of looseness. Now what you can also do if you're having trouble with any of the fibres which are being particularly stubborn is do what I call focused rubbing and with your finger or fingers going in exactly the same direction, so the direction of the yarns in this case, um, you just do some very focused rubbing in the same direction to really um, try and encourage them to bond in that very place that you've got them. So you don't want to be moving your hands and fingers around that way because all you're doing is breaking the bonds, uh, you know, that the fibres are sort of trying to, to create with each other. So we want to encourage those, those bonds. So a little bit of focused rubbing uh, can, do, can do wonders if you're having trouble with certain bits that are really just refusing to, to felt. And of course your other option, which I do sometimes do when you get um, things that are particularly tricky and just refusing to play ball, um, is uh, use a felting needle. Um, that's obviously a really good way of then forcing the fibre below and the yarn on top to bond together. Um, so just a few stabs with a felting needle is sometimes all it takes just to get something, it just needs a helping hand to, to start to bond in. So, yep, it's going to need more, more rubbing, but um, I think initially I just wanted to get some soap on there. So I'm going to turn this over. So I'm going to give this side a good soap up too, uh, and then carry on rubbing. So that probably has worked out at 15 or 20 minutes of rubbing through the bubble wrap um, in the end. Um, I've also been doing a little bit of rubbing with my hands, uh, particularly around these side edges. I just want to make sure that that's, uh, we get a nice sh tight fit there against the, the template. Um, and pretty much everything is staying in place. There's a tiny bit of movement, um, but I think 
um, because we're now going to move on to the rolling stage um, you know hopefully that will be sorted out and fully bonded by the time that we've we've done that so I've given everything a really good soap up again before we move on to rolling um, replace the bubble wrap and we're now going to roll our package so I've got this rolling tool just a foam tool I'm going to just roll up the fiber wrapped template this is why it's important to have a flexible uh, template and then I'm going to to help with the grip roll the whole lot up in a tea towel and that helps keep everything together so what we're going to do is a hundred rolls uh, sort of and out and back counts as, as one roll um, so we'll do a hundred of those uh, then unwrap the package and uh, see what things look like so that was a hundred rolls so I've unwrapped it and we're just Check it, check everything looks all right. Sometimes things can get a bit misshapen, you might want to tug the, the felt back into shape. But that's all looking fine. So I'm gonna cover it up again. Turn the package 90 degrees clockwise roll it up again and do another 100 and I'm going to carry on until I've done 400 and um, each time I've done 100 rolls unwrap it just check everything's looking all right uh, and then turn it 90 degrees and roll it up again so I will carry on with that so we're back to the beginning again so I've now done 400 rolls on each of the four compass points I can already feel um, the felt becoming much thicker and hopefully these yarns are all starting to get more and more secure so that's 400 rolls done and what we're going to do now is turn over the package and do exactly the same another 400 rolls on all the compass points on the other side and all of that agitation will hopefully bond everything together uh, pretty well. Okay, so I'll turn it over and do my next 400. So that's our felt after 800 rolls, 400 on each side. Um, things are definitely feeling a bit thicker and um, much more bonded together. I've still got the odd little fibre that's perhaps, or yarn, um, that's still got a slight bit of movement, but um, I think on the whole, that's pretty good. So I'm just been giving it a little bit of a rub with my hats, hands, um, making them very soapy, uh, just to, again, add a bit more agitation. Uh, but I think the... Uh, the extra level of agitation from the rolling has, has done the trick. So what we're going to do now is take the template out um, and measure and cut our flap. So we'll get rid of the that extra bit of plastic. And also the template. Now hopefully the inside will feel quite well bonded already. So we won't actually have to do too much to that. Yeah, I mean, I can feel actually the felt itself is feeling quite thick. Um, so that's done quite a good job of felting together. If things were feeling a bit bit fluffy and dry and loose in there maybe then I'd take a bit of time now to rub the uh, around the inside again with a give it a good spray very soapy hand and really rub the inside 
um, but actually I can feel that that's um, pretty good on the felt front so I don't need to do that. So we can move on to uh, working out um, where we're going to make our cut. Now we're actually going to cut out a rectangle section um, including the fringe on one of the sides. Um, now that seems a bit drastic as we've spent so long creating these beautiful fringes but I do have ideas to share with you later on what we can do with the excess. Um, so we need to decide which side we like best and which side we want to keep and which to get rid of. So I'm just going to sort of look now. Um, one side will always speak to you more than the other. Um, so this is obviously the main body of our purse, that's staying, whatever happens. So it's whether we prefer having that side over there like that. Or that side over there like that. I think maybe I like that one a little bit more. So we're going to keep this side. So keep that face down on the table and actually put the piece that way up so the fringe is at the bottom. Now I already know that um, I need to measure 16 centimetres down and make a cut across there. So, get a tape measure and a ruler. Okay. So I'm going down to the 16 centimetre point, creating a a line and then I'm going to cut up the sides and across. Um, now you might be wondering how on earth do you make a line on on wet felt? Well in actual fact we can create a sort of temporary indented line uh, using a ruler. So I'm going to measure this at this point about so it's about there and then Sort of check it by eye hopefully that's straight it's a bit hard to tell from this angle um, and just if I just rub the ruler across you see we've created a really um, visible indent there which we can use as our cutting line so I'll just check that that's that's 16 that's 16 looks about right from my angle okay And then using, you'll probably want bigger, you know, big scissors for this, as opposed to sewing scissors. We're going to cut up this side. Now, the thing to remember actually is, um, at the moment, everything is really in a sort of pre-felt stage, really. Uh, we haven't had any shrinkage. So um, we're going to, to cut this part away to then create the flap from the remaining part. Um, now, because we're going to get some shrinkage, I've found that it's better to actually not cut away um, as much of the flap as you think you want uh, because it will shrink a bit. Um, once it's cut and sort of set free if you like, um, that edge will shrink more than you expect. So what I'm going to do is almost, you've got a bit of a side going on there, there's a thickness there, that's our sort of side edge. So I'm going to cut inside of that actually. Um, so you can see I've kind of left that edge and I'm cutting in, well, perhaps not, maybe half a centimetre along there. And by doing that, although it looks like a big curled edge right now and looks like there'd be too much there, in the end, that will create a nice flap, um, you know, that's flat and meets the edge of the, uh, the rest of the body of the purse. So um, don't be too keen to to cut lots away when you've still got some shrinkage to go. There we go. And then I'm just going to cut down 
my indent, which I can see, so that's all right. Okay. Now, of course, we never throw anything away, so we'll do something with that um, later, and I'll show you at the end. So there is our purse. If we fold that down, that gives you more of an idea of what it's going to look like in the end. Um, now, the other thing I like to do, but you don't have to, um, I'm going to stretch this a bit more into shape. I prefer to kind of round off the corners a little bit, um, just because I think that looks nicer. So I'm not going to take loads off, just a real gentle rounding of the corners. It's probably better to take a smaller amount at the beginning because you can always cut a bit more. Just a bit around there too. And the nice thing about cutting the felt at this stage is that these cut edges, because we've got the shrinkage to go, um, won't look like raw cut edges by the end. They've got time to sort of firm up a little bit, which is what we want. Okay, so that's a bit nicer looking. And you can see at the moment, if I flatten out that whole side, it actually extends beyond the sides of the purse, but that's going to shrink. So we need that to leave that little bit of extra there. Right, so that's, that's ready. Um, the next thing we're gonna do uh, is rub these edges because of course these are raw at the moment and we need to firm them up a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time just rubbing them with the usual wet and soapy hands just to firm them up a bit. So, rubbing along the, that edge, sort of catching the edge in between my fingers so that I'm firming both the flat part of that edge and the cut edge itself. And it doesn't take long just to give them a bit of a rub so that they're not, don't go completely sort of raw and fluffy. What we want is slightly firmer, thicker edges. Okay. And then also, obviously on these side edges. So again, that's something where sort of you can catch the edges in between your fingers. So again, really soapy hands for this. Just to create you know, firmer, not sort of fluffy cut edges. And we don't need to worry really about that top edge because obviously that was firmed up quite a long time ago in the process. So again, I'm sort of just rubbing them in between two fingers and I've got another finger sort of along the top. And already you can see that's created a nicer shape. So you want to rub all those edges for a few minutes until they seem bit firmer. So that's our purse all rubbed and rolled. We've cut our shape so now we need to move on to uh, filling the felt um, which is where it gets its shrinkage um, which is what gives it its stability uh, and strength. So we're going to be throwing the uh, felt loosely on the work surface, um, probably for about 300 or so throws, but in groups of 50. And each time I'm gonna check progress, reshape it, 
um, and uh, to keep an eye on, on how it's going on. So let's start that. So it's just loosely picking it up. In actual fact, what I might do first, because it's very wet, um, so I can see that I'm going to get a face full of soap if I start throwing this. So I'm just going to squeeze out a bit of the water. I can see that water is very blue, so the dye is coming out of something there. But that's fine, once we've rinsed it, um, that won't be an issue. Okay, so that's a bit better, so I won't be getting it in the face. Um, I'll just loosely pick it up and I'll throw it on the table. So I think that was about 50. And you'll see soon, actually, how the yarns, as uh, they start to um, shrink up along with the felt, because they're bonded to it, um, the fibres are starting to go more wiggly than they were before. Uh, so that was 50, and I can already see I'm getting more of a crinkle to the, the surface here. Um, and our sort of ridge on the uh, flap edges has kind of disappeared already. So I just want to keep, because I want to maintain this uh, rectangle shape. So each time I want to stretch that out. So that, that that shape is kept. Okay, that was 50. So I'm going to carry on in groups of 50, reshaping each time. Uh, and I think you'll really notice the difference uh, once, once I've done 300 or so size-wise. So I think I've done 300 throws and hopefully you can see how um, the whole purse has shrunk. We've got that what I call crocodile skin or orange peel texture. Um, it feels very thick. Um, I hope you can see actually here how the edges of the flap that seemed so much bigger are now in line with the rest of the purse. So again, um, it's a, a useful tip to remember uh, for making this sort of thing in future that you need to leave a little bit of extra uh, to account for the shrinkage. Um, but we've got nice firm edges. Um, now one thing I did want to show you, um, squares and rectangles have a real habit of, of flaring out a bit. And if that happens, if you just roll them diagonally in on themselves, just a few quick rolls, it's just enough to kind of get shrinkage in that direction, which is what you want. And that sort of brings them back in again um, so that they're not all flary. Well, what we want is actually just a nice sort of rounded edge. So I hope you can see how that one I think looks much better than this one, which I haven't done anything to. So let's give that a little roll as well. And it doesn't take much. I mean, at this stage, things happen pretty quickly. So you can make very small adjustments to sort of stretch things, straighten things. And you can see how everything has really uh, gone, gone wriggly and, and crinkly, um, which is great. And, you know, importantly, I can feel that this uh, feels well felted. Uh, it's got that good crinkle to it. So I think we can stop there. Um, so the final thing to do is to rinse it and then give it a final shape. So I'm gonna rinse it and then I'll, I'll bring it back and we'll, we'll do that final shaping. Um, the one thing I would say about rinsing um, is uh, the whole m sort of process of rinsing something, and I tend to use warm water, uh, you don't have to have boiling hot water or anything like that, unless you really, really want to shrink something aggressively. Um, but just to rinse out the soap and water that's in this, I'm just going to use warm water um, and keep, keep squeezing until the water uh, runs clear. Um, now, just that act of putting it in the water, squeezing it, then I'm going to roll it in a towel to sort of dry it, all of that acts as extra agitation, you know, all that manipulation of, of you know, what we do to it during the rinsing and drying process. So um, another good tip that I've found is 
and um, you know if if you still think there's a little bit of shrinkage to go just a tiny bit oh I might just give that another 50 throws or 25 throws actually stop before you do that because um, the manipulation that this is going to get during the the rinsing process will actually do a bit of that work for you so there is a danger particularly if you want very exact sizes in the end um, that you could over felt and over shrink it so um, a good tip is always to stop just before the point where you think you know it's shrunk enough do all your rinsing because you can always once it's been rinsed give it a bit more rubbing to shrink it further uh, but of course it's hard to to you know increase the size once it's already shrunk so um try and try and remember that in future just um stop just before you think you're ready uh, and then see what 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 you think after it's uh, been rinsed out okay so i'm going to go and rinse it and then i'll come back and show you what it looks like so i've rinsed out all the soap and uh, giving it a bit of a squeeze and um, try and avoid wringing it when you're um, rinsing just sort of squeeze it to, to gently um, get the soap out um, I'm gonna wrap it in a towel and roll it up just to try and get a bit more of the water out and then let's just give it a, a reshape Now obviously I did 300 throws with this, but you know your piece will vary depending on what fibre you're using. Um, so obviously 300 throws is a sort of guideline, it all, all, all depends really. Um, but once things seem quite thick and well felted and it's got that texture to the, uh, to the surface, then you can sort of safely stop, I think. Now there are a few other things we need to do like trimming the fringe down uh, because I think it'll look better not to have lots of very uneven looking uh, lengths and um, and also I think to to probably stop them before the edge of the uh, of the purse um, but I think I'll leave that until it's dry so I'm going to leave this to dry uh, overnight uh, and just leave it lying on a towel or on a radiator and come back tomorrow uh, and we'll do sort of the final final touches to it. So here's the finished purse. I did a bit more shaping with my hands, uh, just rubbing along the edges just to get straight edges. Um, and then I left it to dry overnight on a radiator. Then I ironed it once it was dry uh, with a steam iron and I always think ironing felt just um, smooths out the fibres beautifully and, and just finishes it off nicely. So uh, it had an iron. Uh, then I trimmed the fringe just so that the edges didn't go beyond the bottom edge of the purse, as that sort of seemed logical to me. Um, the final thing that I haven't done yet, what I will do is sew on some sort of uh, magnetic clasp to the inside so that it closes. So that's our finished purse. Um, now, it'd be interesting just to compare um, the sizes with our original template. Um, if I open it out, you can see we had quite a bit more shrinkage actually in the length than we did in the width. Um, I've probably got about 25% shrinkage going that way. Um, and I put that down to the fact that this was an open template, so in the early stages, while it was the felt was still in the template, um, actually more uh, shrinkage could go on in that direction than could go on in this direction, uh, because the felt was obviously um, hampered by the fact that there was a template inside. So I think that's why we've ended up with more uh, shrinkage going in that direction. So uh, yeah, just an interesting point to note, really. Um, and the finish size has ended up being something like. Uh, 21 centimetres across by 14 centimetres down. That's with the flap um, folded down. Um, now I did say that I would give you some ideas about what we could do with that extra piece of felt that we took away. Um, and I've got a couple of examples to show you. Um, 
this was a previous purse that I'd uh, made. So exactly the same size, exactly the same sized rectangle extra bit. Now with this one, all I did was, because the felt, by the time we cut that piece off, uh, was already quite a well-worked pre-felt, if you like. Um, so all I did was gave it a good rub around all of the edges to sort of make them nice. I also actually cut the fringe off, which was a bit of a shame, but I couldn't quite make it work with this design. Uh, so I cut that off, rubbed, gave the edges a good rub. And then all I did was throw the felt for something like 200 throws. Because it's so small, that was enough actually to, to felt it. Then I've uh, left it to dry, ironed it, and ironed a fold in, um, added a little clasp, uh, and that works quite nicely as a uh, sort of pin or needle case. So that was one idea. Um, and then what I actually did with the piece from this purse, um, I made a sort of mini me purse. Uh, now with this one it was slightly different, I kept the fringe. Um, and if you imagine, we're talking about a piece a bit like this. So what I did was I folded it together um, in half, kind of that way. Uh, so I still kept the fringe at one end. Um, and I sewed the edge, the side edge and the bottom edge together. So again, this is a piece of kind of heavily worked pre-felt I was working on. Um, so if you can imagine, I ended up with uh, a pouch, a bit like that, where I'd sewed up the side and bottom edges. And I then really, really um, worked on those edges to try and felt them together. Um, now, the reason I sewed it first was because this was was pre-felt, um, it probably needed a bit of a helping hand really to try and felt together um, because it had already you know, been partially felted. So by just sewing along the edge or the edges, um, that just gave it a little bit of help. And then when I was rubbing it, um, you know, really putting sort of pressure along the edge, um, that just gave it a helping hand to encourage it to, to felt together. And of course, you can't see the stitches afterwards, they just sort of disappear into the felt. So um, that's always an idea of things that you can do if you want to sort of change what you're working on. Um, you can do it as late as the pre-felt stage um, and sort of make adaptations like that. Um, probably not much after that, otherwise you're then into the realms of just having a fabric that you sew together. Um, but to actually take advantage of the the sort of self-sealing part of, of the fibres. Um, we've just at the very edge of that pre-felting stage got, got some time to do it where the fibres will still bond together and it's not too late. Uh, so, so that's what I did. So I made a sort of pouch and then exactly like we did with the purse, um, I cut off a tiny, a tiny flap piece. Um, so I've now got that piece left over um, so that created a mini purse. Quite what I do with this piece, I don't know. It will go into my um, recycling stash and maybe one day I'll find a use for it. Uh, I don't think I can make anything else with it now. Um, so a couple of ideas there for other things, obviously, that you can make with that extra piece that we cut off. Uh, I'm sure you can think of, think of other ideas too. So that's it for this tutorial. Um, thanks again for watching. Um, please check all the details in the description below. All the measurements and everything you need will all be down there, uh, as well as the link to my previous videos. Um, do please like this video, subscribe to my channel uh, if you enjoyed it, and I'd love to hear from you too, so do please leave me a comment below. Um, all right, thanks again for watching. Happy felting.